Today, reducing solar farm O&M with robotic tractors. I'm Tim Montague, your host. Welcome to SolarWorks for Illinois. Today, we're going to learn about a very innovative and cutting edge system called Renew Robotics. Company is based in San Antonio, Texas. And my guest is the founder and CEO of Renew Robotics. His name is Tim Mattis. He is a mechanical engineer and MBA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I also went to the University of Wisconsin. We haven't talked about that yet, but maybe we can dive into being Badgers together as well, Tim. Welcome to SolarWorks for Illinois. Great. Thanks, Tim. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on your show. I'm excited to bring a all-electric autonomous vehicle on the show. You are, you are my first, and uh, I'm a big fan of automation and robotics in general. While it is a double edge, robotics and automation are going to uh, change our economy. I think for the better, generally speaking, while some jobs will be lost, it's really about uh, making widely available technology more affordable. And so, so as we are adding 14 gigawatts of solar to the United States now on an annual basis, and that could grow dramatically, I just did a recording with Taylor McNair on the 2035 report where we could reach a clean grid by 2035 by installing 35 gigawatts of solar every year. So that could, that 14 gigawatts could grow tremendously. But tell us a little bit about your background and what was the ideation of Renew? So I, I have a background in engineering, as you had mentioned. I worked for a company first out of college called Miller Electric. Uh, it was in Wisconsin. Um, I started as an engineer, but quickly uh, it was purchased by Illinois Toolworks, Fortune 200 company. Uh, gave me a chance to do a first startup. Uh, I, my first startup was a company uh, was in plasma cutting under the umbrella of Miller Electric and ITW. Uh, got my interest in entrepreneurialism and startups. Uh, I was a venture manager, business unit manager, ran all pieces of that company, moved it up to about 15 million in revenues. Uh, and then I ran all of R&D for Miller Electric after that. Uh, gave me an experience really in the corporate world as well as R&D under that type of umbrella. So one of the products that I worked on early on in my career was robots. We put welding systems on robots. We didn't make any, but we actually created a lot of uh, systems that were set up to work with robots. So the interest was always there. Um, this is the first time I've gotten back into the autonomous and robotic world. Uh, it's exciting to be in this area. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, just tickled to see how electric vehicles have come along. And mm -hmm. your product is the first all-electric tractor that I'd seen, and it is also autonomous. So that's a double, uh, double whammy. But tell us a little more about how how do robotic tractors make sense for solar farm owners and operators? So, you know, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense when you're talking about maintaining solar farms to put electric tractors in place because the power is there. It's being generated by the sun. Their cost of power is low. Um, the reality is the other piece is it reduces emissions. Um, Tractors out there, similar to ours, would put 20,000 pounds of CO2 in the air, air every year. And we don't need to produce those emissions. So we can charge up quickly, uh, go operate and charge multiple times a day off electric power. We don't have to run fuel out to those sites. That's another truck bringing fuel out to handle it. So it really makes sense in this area. And actually, I think it's going to expand into a whole lot of areas uh, way beyond here because it just makes sense. So tell us exactly how does this system work? So this is a electric tractor that has a 25 kilowatt hour battery. It's about the third, a third the size of a, of a car, electric car on the road today. So it's a pretty good size. It'll actually charge up um, from the solar grid if necessary or off AC power. It will operate, we'll send it out in the evening. Uh, it will cut grass for three and a half to four and a half hours, and then it'll return to its station to charge. Now, during that time, it'll have blocks that it's scheduled to go on. It'll go out, start mowing a certain block. Uh, it can be programmed to go underneath panels and areas. There's times it may lose 
it's GPS. It has a GPS with RTK correction. That actually allows it to have a capability of plus or minus two centimeters to know where it's at. Sometimes when you go under solar panels, you can lose that GPS. Uh, in those cases, we use the LIDAR that's on there that will actually monitor the panels and determine where it needs to position itself underneath the panels. There's some additional uh, technology inside of it that maintains how many wheel turns it has, where it's at, how it moves uh, to help make that calculation. But those things help it to run all the time and figure out where it needs to go. It'll go ahead and, and mow. It monitors other things out in the field, uh, if there's any maintenance needed. If it runs into an object that it doesn't really know what to do uh, with, uh, say somebody leaves a toolbox out on site, it'll actually stop. It'll actually contact our team We'll be able to turn on cameras on the system, take a look at it, map around the toolbox, and then provide a report to the customer that there's somebody left a toolbox out on the site. So the robot is navigating by GPS. You mentioned this RTK technology. It's a radio technology and LIDAR. Does the robot, you know, there's... In the world of the built environment, there's the as-built site plan, right, with geolocated points on the project, in this case, solar farms. But then there's the actual reality, right? And the world changes over time, and there can be errors in the exact location of things. So is the robot learning as it goes? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great thing is we are monitoring these systems all the time and we're looking for things that could possibly change or move. So that is a learning process that it is picking up, teaching us what's happening out on that solar site. That's additional data that works for the customers as well. If panels start to move, things are out of place, we'll be able to provide data on that. If wires are hanging down, we can see those wires. We can provide that data to customers. Uh, we see, uh, you know, if there's new objects in place, you know, when some areas get heavy rain, it will cause, cause washouts, rocks will show up. We'll provide data on that as well to customers so they can go out and look at those areas, fix them, repair them, clean them up. Uh, it has the ability to provide lots of additional data way beyond just doing the mowing. I love it that it's pure electric and autonomous. <laughs> What are the trade-offs to doing a pure electric tractor? I, I note that I, while there are quite a few electric cars on the road today and for sale in the US, I'm not aware of any electric tractors. Are, are truly large-scale tractors driven by batteries coming out now? Well, I think we'll see more people looking at that area in the future. There's there were big challenges for us to make this first tractor. Uh, when I first was looking for a battery and we calculated about how much energy we needed, the difficulty to find a supplier of a battery, it, people just didn't exist out there that could provide us a battery that was the cost, uh, had the right cost for us, had the right size, was able to make this move and do its job. We finally found somebody, we worked with a company out of California uh, they provided a solution, and it was a pretty new company, pretty new solution. Uh, since then, we have multiple players that have come into the market that are all new companies providing battery solutions, and this is something that worked really well for our tractor. It's going down in size and weight with more energy storage. And one of the really neat things, if you've ever watched you know, some of the new battery technology is uh, the amount of the life cycles of batteries have gone up, and we see that potential to go up substantially. So when you look at it from an energy perspective, how much power it takes, how much you would spend on gas versus how much you'd spend on electricity and batteries, we've come to that point where you save money by going with electric uh, substantially, even if you have to replace the battery. Now, if we're looking at batteries that can last 10, 15, 20 years, the cost goes down even another uh, multiple of, of the cost from, from the beginning. So we see a huge gain you know, in that cost structure. Again, you don't have to deal with creating emissions with electric. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense. Now, I don't think right away we're gonna see big farm tractors that typically are running 500 horsepower engines. Uh, and my family has farms in Minnesota, but I think it's coming. I think we're gonna see a day when we're gonna have probably a connection between either hydrogen fuel and electric 
that will solve some of that problem when it comes to large equipment, large tractors that need a lot of power. So we're kind of in a mid range. We're not just a little mower doing an acre and a half. We're cutting 100 to 200 acres in a month. We're able to charge up multiple times. We have electric power supply that's really close by, but we can actually use a lot of energy and go out there and, and take care of a field. If we were gonna be plowing or chopping up uh, corn or something like that, it would take a substantial amount more power. Now, I, I would say that the hydrogen makes a lot of sense when we go there, but we're trying to make clean energy. I don't know if that market will aim after that, but we'll start to see more electric tractors in place. Um, and we're gonna be that first company out there doing it. In the event that there's not AC power on the site, what is the cost of installing a, a charging station uh, that's run by solar? Do you, do you know what that cost is? I do, and we actually provide a full skid of solar panels. We can drop out a skid of solar panels for about $13,000 in your location that will provide all the fuel that it needs for the next 10 years. So the, the tractor or the robot mows for three and a half to four hours, then it comes back, it connects to the charger, and if it's, if it's solar charging on a sunny day, how quickly can it charge? So we can put multiple skids out there. We can put one skid on a typical day. We would actually put a skid out there that would charge it in about six and a half to eight hours of time from the sun. Um, we can put multiple units out there that would allow it to charge in half that time. We could also put additional storage on those solar panels that will store up power and give you the ability to charge it faster. So a lot of things that can be done, but a typical uh, time would be to charge it once a day and then go run that three and a half to four and a half hours and cut its five to seven acres. And theoretically, it could run at night too, right? Yeah, and we're planning that in many locations. We'll run in the evening or at night. Uh, this is a system being all electric. It doesn't make as much noise as a gas or diesel driven mower, uh, which you would hear if it's running next to your house or nearby. It still makes some noise as blades spinning at 3000 RPMs are going to make some noise, but it's still much quieter. Uh, running in the evening makes a lot of sense. It's less, uh, less heat. Usually in the summertime is when we're mowing a lot of grass. Uh, so instead of mowing when it's 100 degrees, which it is in San Antonio right now, um, it will mow in the times in the evening when it's maybe more like uh, 80 degrees or something like that. It gives the battery longer life as well as components, uh, but just makes sense as well. So you started the company in 2018. You now have a couple of installations that are up and running. What is the, what is the status of the company and the product? So yeah, we started in 2018. Um, I reached out to Mike Iman, another founder along with me, uh, you know, asked him if he had some ideas of a, a company to start around manufacturing engineering. And he said, yeah, you know, I've been looking for a solution for this. I've worked in the solar industry for quite a few years. Um, and he said, there's nobody doing anything for this. There's no automation available. And it's difficult to find people to mow. It's difficult to get these jobs done. So we started the business at that point in time. Uh, first thing we did is worked on putting together a prototype to demonstrate our technology, a generation one of our, of our product. Uh, we moved quickly in a hiring some people in a team to build the next generation, generation two system. Uh, so we built those for testing in 2019 and put them out in locations. We've actually sold a few of those systems as well with a customer. Um, and those have been, so we've operated those and we're getting some of those operating again uh, and keeping those continually running on site. Uh, we're now preparing generation three where we've updated it with a lot of the data and information we've learned from testing and from customer feedback in order to put that in this generation three and we'll begin production uh, in July and August. So the, the robot is approaching <clears throat> wide availability, so to speak, right? Right, we're still very slow as we're rolling it out so that we you know, get it re really operating in a, in a really standard process, but also easy to manufacture. Uh, one of the key things of feedbacks that we've gotten over time is, you know, we know that this has to cut a lot of grass, it has to have a long service life, 
So we've developed a system in this generation three to really be easy to maintain, to repair, all modular components inside, easy to put together, and we can train people out in the field that are technicians quickly to repair it and replace items inside of it. What is the anticipated life of a tractor? So we really have designed it for a 10 year life, but we can move it beyond that as well. We provide a refurbishment. So this isn't an uh, engine inside of a machine. So the life on the motors is still finite, but it can be seven to 7,000 to 10,000 hours on electric motor. Uh, that will give us about a 10 year life. We can refurbish it by replacing some of those components where there's bearings and motors. There's no oil to change all the time. The battery is another thing that has a finite life of about 12, 000, 1,200 cycles. Um, that can be increased by, by not charging it as high. So charging it at 90% instead of 100% or not, not running all the energy out of it, leaving a little bit of energy in the bottom of it. it extends the life so we can bring it up to like 1,500 cycles to 2,000 cycles. We also don't cut every month. A lot of times there's a couple months a year where we, we don't do cutting. So we can push that beyond. Uh, if we're cutting less than 100 acres a year, a battery at the end of its life means it only can charge up to 80%. We can still use those batteries to cut for years beyond that. So we do recommend that refurbishment at about five years if it's used to cut a couple hundred acres uh, and maintain that space. But if we are doing less than that, that will last beyond that. Um, and that's a simple thing for us to upgrade it to basically uh, paint, repainted new unit. It looks very good. We put it back out in the field and get it to work again. So a 10 year life is a good fit. Uh, we've already had people ask for a 15 year life and we look at a couple refurbishments during that time. And in a setting like the, uh, let's just say the Carolinas where there's a lot of solar and you know they have a long growing season, it's favorable climate, for grass and weeds and what, what can a single robot handle in terms of acreage? So we typically talk 100 to 200 acres. In the very high growth areas, we would look at 100 acres per unit to maintain because you're going to have to mow a lot. We also would up the charge capability in those places where we can do multiple charges on it in a day. Um, that will help us to be able to put it out multiple times during that really high growing season, which might be in April, May time frame. Um, and then we address it. Then as soon as it starts getting hot and a little more dry, you see less growth. So we can run it just one time a day or so. So about 100 acres in those high growth situations, uh, 200 acres in the medium growth situations. And I assume that there are uh, levels of charging like there are with, with electric vehicles? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that, again, I'll bring up that it, it, it gives uh, savings on the battery for the life cycle. So we can do levels of charging. And if we see an area where we just need to charge it for a little bit and put it back out there, if we're running on a, um, on a solar panel and we know we've got a few hours of daylight left, we could bring it back, charge it up, and then send it back out in the evening to finish uh, an area. Certainly, there's a lot of optimization that we'll have room for that we're just beginning to look at at this point in time. Um, as you can consider, uh, when we're monitoring it all the time and we know when it's running, how much energy it uses in each spot, uh, there's a lot of data that we can calculate and collect so that we can make sure that we're utilizing and optimizing it uh, for its use. What, what is the profile of a typical customer, you think? So the customer profile today um, and the ones we're talking to and the few sales we're starting to just put out there, um, they have, they have they're, they're larger asset owners or o &M providers. So, and sometimes there's a combination there, they do both. Um, the asset owners might have uh, large solar farms that are a hundred acres, might be larger than that. We have some that even have smaller ones out in the East Coast that are 20 to 50 acres, but they have growth and it's a constant difficulty to keep a mode and to get a team of people out there to mow them at the right time. So they're looking at this as a solution. Uh, it's, it on the book saves money for them right away. They're very interested. Um, they have to deal with all the difficulties of the logistics of getting out to these locations. So you can imagine the assets, solar assets are located, you know, on outskirts of town. So a lot of times somebody to go mow will have to drive an hour, hour and a half to even get out to the so uh, there's a lot of wasted time in that. 
to have a machine on site to be able to go ahead and take care of these maintenance items and they can monitor it and just go over and do the maintenance necessary, changing blades out, doing some inspections once a month or once every couple of weeks, makes a lot of sense. It's also a great fit. The O&M providers are really technicians that are very good. They understand electrical, they understand these facilities, they understand all the safety standards associated with it. For them to work on our units and uh, make sure they're maintained and use them in their fields, it really is a fit, it makes a lot of sense. So the asset owners, of course, are very large companies, typically. Um, there's multiple, they typically have power companies. They could be coal, nuclear, uh, solar, but they're moving much more. Natural gas, of course, and they're moving much more into renewable energy, including wind and solar. Uh, and we're continuing to see a, a big movement towards that, as you mentioned before, the amount of growth we're seeing in, in solar, and we're seeing some of that in wind as well. Um, so that's the, the la large asset owners are the ones that are really interested. But now more of the O&M providers are talking to us because they want to provide a better solution that's less expensive for their customer. In addition, they also see the advantage of, of not having to uh, deal with, um, with mowing systems with, uh, that they have to purchase and hiring teams to run those for a certain time of the year. And uh, this will also allow them to keep it maintained monthly instead of doing it four times a year or five times a year or six times a year. One of the first things that I think of is, you know, is there a, is there a size to a solar field that, uh, or a threshold in size where renew starts to play? Um, you know, here in Illinois, we have really two types of solar farms. We have uh, CNI and community solar. These are, uh, you know, anything from an acre to 20 acre solar farms. And then we have utility scale. And those are just getting uh, designed and engineered right now. None of them have actually been built. But those are 100 and 200 megawatt projects, some of them as large as 1600 acres. Where does size play into this? So we originally developed this to really manage farms that are around 100 acres and above. So, you know, years, years back, solar farms started at that 15 to 20 acre range. They moved quickly up to the 100, probably about eight to 10 years ago, the 100 acre to 150 acre range. Now we typically are seeing them in a thousand acres, a couple thousand acres. Um, we know of companies that are looking at 10 to 20,000 acres to set up in solar farms now. Um, we developed it for that 100 acre and plus, but what we've also done is we've scaled a model that really fits for the smaller customers as well. Uh, we look at it and we said, you know, when you go to a customer that has uh, 40 or 50 acres, we don't need to spend as much time monitoring it and controlling those units and those units will last longer. So we can actually scale down the cost somewhat for that customer and help them and it still makes a fit in that 50 acres and above. And we've even found some places where even at smaller, smaller solar farms, community solar, where it still makes sense because the difficulty in getting somebody out there to mow it, the cost associated, it just makes, still makes sense to have one of these units in their location. Can you say anything about your existing customer base? So, uh, we have a first customer, uh, Dominion Energy, that's worked really close with us out in the East Coast. Uh, a great team of people. They, were, they saw the potential with our system. They were willing to work right away and purchase some units for us. Um, and we work closely with them. Um, and we have three units that we're operating with their, with their solar facilities. Um, we have many customers that are similar to that that are talking to us at this point in time. We have proposals out for more than 20 systems um, and they're all in the power industry, all doing solar. So I can't talk too much about them. We have NDAs in place with most of those customers, but, um, but you would probably recognize them if you showed up one of the Solar Power International shows or something similar to that. Yeah, Dominion has certainly been in the news and uh, I don't, I, I, I I connect them to Virginia. Is is that where they play heavily? 
yes, they are out of Richmond, Virginia, and they are okay. on the East Coast. Yep. And the Virginia market is exploding now. They have 100% RPS now, and so there'll be lots of growth there. Um, they, they definitely want to dedicate it to 100% renewable by 2054, I believe. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about the future of this technology. Of course, the the there will be incremental improvements to both the electric vehicle components and the autonomous vehicle aspects of this but in addition to vegetation management what are some other aspects of solar farm o m that come to mind for your technology so today you know we talk a lot about autonomous cars the technology is out there and we're really riding off of those those coattails in a sense because the technology that's being developed for the autonomous cars is what we're using in our system. We're much closer to an autonomous car than we are to a Roomba. I know everybody says, well, it's like a Roomba for solar, right? But it's a lot more like an autonomous car. Um, that technology, as you can imagine, is, is being considered the autonomous car stuff on the roads. Uh, we're, we also uh, look at autonomous nature of in manufacturing. There's a lot of stuff out there. It's a $30 billion industry already, um, which is great. It's a lot easier to make a system to operate inside of a manufacturing plant than it is to have one go across the ground around people and, and stuff doing roadways. Um, so, but you can imagine uh, we're ready to start moving in those directions. So autonomous vehicles and this electric tractor can go into a lot of places and we're going to see them in the next few years all over the place providing maintenance cleaning up our roads mowing and doing other things we think the the opportunity is actually quite huge um, in the things that can do even in a small agriculture so i'll bring that up a little bit but i'm going to focus back our company is really focused in solar and we have a lot of things we can do there mowing is the first one and we're going to do a really good job with it but we'll move on to be able to do spraying uh, to be able to spray in places around posts and fence lines and take care of those areas to be able to service the whole vegetation management piece for the solar industry and other energy uh, areas as far as power plants and, uh, and transmission lines and roadways and those type of things. In addition, we think inspections is a big piece that we can play, um, even monitoring solar panels. About a half a percent of solar panels of fail per year. And that's just a number that I was told from the industry. Um, and they have to be replaced. So determining where they are uh, is a difficult thing. And today it's done by sending drones over and taking uh, video and then pictures and looking at that to determine which panels failed. As you can imagine with a machine on the ground that's autonomous, it can go around with a camera and we can look at the panels and we can look for signs that the panels are going to fail prior to them even failing, right? Looking for delamination, looking for discoloration, looking for temperature changes within the panel. Uh, with that, we'll be able to uh, send information back and tell exactly where the, where the panel is and, when, and probably even predict when it's going to fail. So changes can be made out. The idea is keeping these solar farms running at the optimal performance. And we think this system is really gonna help them be able to do that. Uh, in addition, one of the other high costs is cleaning solar panels. Um, we have some plans in place and we've already put some concepts together around a system that would be autonomous, autonomous vehicle electric tractor that will be mowing, going along and actually cleaning the solar panels um, with a brush. There's several ways to achieve it. Uh, we've got some concepts around it, like I said, uh, but in places where it's dry, uh, you need to clean those panels more often than to have the optimum performance. In places where it's wet, you probably more, more, mow more grass, uh, and you still have to clean, but not as often. So we think it can be a, a real good fit with our autonomous system to perform this maintenance. And it will help make solar less expensive all the time. You know, the goal is to drive down that cost so much that it's three cents a kilowatt, right? So we can have customers paying less for the electricity that's renewable. That's when we'll know we'll, we'll be aiming for that 100% renewable in the future. Yeah, I see so many possibilities for, uh, you know, big data collecting photography, thermal photography, 
on what is the status of the solar array, what's going on with the wiring, the connectors, the back sheets, is there cracking, uh, is there problems with settling or racking out of place. So having a robot that's running around mowing the grass can then be turned into a multi-purpose vehicle and, and doing cleaning, as you mentioned as well. So that's very exciting. Uh, I want to circle back to the to the economics of this. On your website, you you say that the your business case is that you can improve the economics of solar farm vegetation management by thirty to fifty percent. And of course, there are two major costs. There's the the equipment and the fuel if it's if it's an ice engine driven tractor, and then there's the labor, the the operator. Where is it that you are finding your niche? Yeah, so so when you look at, and we've modeled this out along with customers to understand the costs associated with maintaining these fields. Um, and so part of it is, is reducing labor, but also is consistency. Um, it becomes a much more difficult job. If you mow it and try to minimize the times that you have to mow a field, it causes more difficulty and it's more difficult to maintain later on and the costs go up and it's also a lot more work for the employees that are out on site. In addition, it's a hazardous situation. Now, if you've ever seen anybody in the heat of the summer in Texas that goes out on a solar site and it's dusty and dirty, and now they wear a full suit with a face mask to cover their body because of the dangerous nature of all that stuff getting on your skin, bee stings and other things that can happen out in the site. Uh, it's, it's daunting to think about doing that at 100 degrees. Uh, it's not a nice environment. So we're, we're making actually it safer for people to actually be in the backside monitoring these units, watching them in an air conditioned environment with a machine actually doing the work in the dirty, hot environment and operating. So when it comes to cost savings, I mean, we're reducing costs because we're being more efficient about what we're doing. Uh, we're able to monitor it all the time. We're able to keep it mowed down and mow multiple times instead of just a few times a year. That helps in that process. And we're minimizing damage to panels and other things as well. So those things can play into it. The reality is we're able to make a lower co cost enough system. And with our monitoring versus labor inside of an office building versus labor out in the field, it's less costly. Uh, and employees, a lot of times, you know, people struggle with employees showing up for work, being there on time, getting enough done. Um, there's still some work that has to be done um, on the, in the field with maintenance of our units even. But the technician work that we require on maintaining these units is much more fit with the O&M providers that are already on field doing repairs, changing out solar panels um, and putting up new solar panels and doing things like that. So can you speak to the cost of a system? Sure, I, I, I am happy to speak to the cost of a system and this is just a generalization. Typically we're charging about 45,000 for a unit and we charge a monthly fee around $1,000 per unit per month to monitor it. So from that, you're getting all your software license, the upgrades all the time, and we're monitoring it 24 seven. So when it's operating, we know what, what it's doing. We present, provide reports continually to the customer based on that. Uh, that's just kind of the general cost. Of course, fields that are larger, we'll look at discounts associated with that. But for the most part, that's kind of our model uh, is a subscription fee along with the purchase of the, of the unit. Longer term, we see in the future, we'll probably be providing uh, some lease models as well that will allow customers really just to pay a certain monthly fee to maintain those fields. And what is the feedback that you're getting from your early adopters at this point? The feedback has been, been great. They are excited about the technology. They are excited about the cost savings that they see in it. They also are excited about you know, just the process of how we've developed the business and how we'll operate with them. Uh, it seems to be a, a good fit. And we've done that in a way, working with the O&M providers and the asset owners, because it, it really has to be a connection with the whole group together to understand how to solve this problem and do it well. Uh, and that's been, been a great fit. So, you know, the excitement is huge. You know, this still, still is a very new technology to this industry. 
uh, but they are ready for it. They are very ready for it. Where are you doing manufacturing? So we are manufacturing uh, mostly in Texas. So component manufacturing is done outside and we do final assembly inside. Uh, this is in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we, are, uh, we are in delivery drive. We have a 8,000 square foot facility here. We'll start assembling systems. We'll likely be expanding in other buildings around the area before long. Um, we have uh, manufacturing fabricators in the area uh, and we are working with them closely on producing a lot of the sheet metal and other components, including the plastic cover that comes over the top is produced within San Antonio. Uh, we're looking for U.S. suppliers to be able to do most of the stuff. As you can imagine, there's still some components that have to come from China. Motors, it's hard to find uh, in the U.S. I'm uh, actually working with a company out of the U.K. as well on motors um, that seem like they have some prices and it looks like some good products that could be very fitting. Uh, we have motor controllers coming out of uh, the Phoenix area. Uh, that's, uh, those are seem to be operating very well for us, and that's a, an expensive component for our system, but also a very important component. As you can imagine, computers, uh, you know, they're coming from the U.S. at this point in time. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we have a good unit, and it's around quality, right? Quality and a good price uh, for our customers. So, um, we like the U.S. because it's just easier to find components and easier to work with people. Uh, but we also need to, you know, keep in mind costs. We need to make sure it's reasonable for customers to be able to have spare parts at a reasonable price. So things like mower blades, they need to be changed out about probably once a month if we're mowing a heavy amount of grass. Um, so that'll be a consistent thing that they will be um, replacing. So those costs need to be very good. Um, so we're working with companies. There's a couple companies in the U.S. we're working with. We're talking to one in China as well over that, but um, the most part, we're producing it here in San Antonio. I know the tractor is proprietary. Is the, is the mower proprietary as well? So the mower is proprietary. Um, so we looked at lots of different mower decks out uh, that are made by other companies. Uh, this is very specific to what we're trying to do. As you can imagine, we're working very hard to take every little bit of weight out of the unit as possible because we have to use energy from our battery in order to move any more pounds around. This machine weighs about 1,100 pounds. Uh, we painstakingly went through every piece of the mower trying to take out ounces um, and make that deck just fitting to what we need to do. This is a big deck. It's 63 inch wide uh, with with three motors on it that are two horsepower a piece. They can reach peaks of about five horsepower. Uh, so it's, it's got some weight to it. So we try to make sure we, we make it just fit our machine. And there's no bottle out there that just pops into place. It also has a lot of sensors on it. Uh, our mowing deck has a, a bar in the front, bump bar in the front. If somebody were to touch it, it would shut down the unit right away uh, and then call us. It has um, other things on it that are, we have lights on it. We have other sensors to monitor um, the deck and the mower motors. So we are, we are really having quite a sophisticated mowing deck that we have in the system. In addition, the mowing deck uh, actually tilts up when you're ready to change the blades out and you walk up to it, the maintenance people can hit a button on their iPhone and the deck will tilt. They don't have to get on their knees, don't have to crawl down to order to change the blades out. They can simply remove the bolts, three bolts, and put new blades on. It would take them less than 10 minutes. I love it. A human-friendly robot. Um, it's uh, so important that we, that we make these devices uh, you know, work for us, truly. Um, well, we're almost out of time, Tim. I really appreciate the conversation. And how can our listeners find you? Well, they can find me by going to our website at www.renewbot.com. Uh, they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. It's Tim Mattis uh, and be happy to answer any questions for them or, or work with them in the future. Wonderful. Well, to all our listeners, please check us out on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, give us a thumbs up and tell your friends about us. We really want to get more knowledge and information out to the public about the growing solar industry uh, and the full spectrum from technology to trends and, of course, great information for solar developers and facility owners who might go solar. 
I'm Tim Montague, your host. Thank you so much, Tim Mattis with Renew Robotics. Thank you, Tim. Really appreciate being on the show today. Have a great day.